Hey fellas, help me to reach 1,000 subscribers. Thank you. On September 4th, 1981, 12 year old Tim Slayton and 15 year old Jeff Slayton had their childhood abruptly ended when they found their mother, Linda Slayton, dead in her bedroom at their apartment in Lakeland, Florida. She was found lying partially naked, beaten, with a metal hanger around her neck. Who could have committed such a heinous crime? Could it have been someone close to the family? Or was this a random attack? Welcome back to M7 Crime Story Time, where we shed light on under the radar cases across the country. Today, we're looking into the case of Linda Slayton, a case so twisted, you'll be shocked when you find out who killed her. So without further ado, let's get started. This is Lakeland, Florida, one of the most populous cities in Polk County. Back in 1981, Lakeland was a place with many thriving businesses and residential areas. These residential areas were filled with duplexes, and most belonged to close-knit families that had a lot of young children and toddlers. The area was also filled with lush green grass at every turn, which made the place seem homely. At 303 North Brunel Parkway, where Linda and her two boys lived, there were many duplexes. The family even owned one. However, they hadn't stayed there for very long. Sources said that Linda and her two sons moved from Hartel, Alabama, to Lakeland, Florida, two weeks before the incident took place. What could have led to her death? Could it be that she brought an old vengeance to a new place? Linda Patterson Slayton was born on March 8, 1950. By the time she was 16, she was pregnant with her first son, Jeffrey Slayton. Three years later, she gave birth to a second son, Timothy Slayton. Soon after, she managed to convince the father of her two sons, Frank Slayton, to get married so that they could start a proper family. However, a happy family was far from what she got. Frank turned out to be an abusive husband who would routinely abuse her and the two kids. Plagued by his alcoholism and addiction, he would turn violent whenever he got drunk. Jeff and Tim recalled that their father would often turn into a monster. He was a violent alcoholic and would beat the three of them without any conscience. The thought of filing for divorce soon ran through Linda's mind, and in 1974, Linda Slayton finally became free. She divorced Jeff and Tim's abusive father, Frank Slayton, after nine volatile years of their marriage. Linda started her new life as a single mom with two teenage sons. She tried her best to provide for her family and be there for her sons as a caring mother, juggling work and chores. It was obvious that she had limited financial capabilities. They didn't have a car, so her sons, Jeff and Tim, would often go to school either by walking or by sharing rides if they were offered one. Apart from school, Jeff and Tim loved playing football, but since they didn't have a ride to football practice, their coach, Coach Joe, would often pick them up and drop them off at or nearby their home. A week before the 4th of September, Linda was preparing her home to welcome her mother. She wanted her mother to move and since she thought her presence in the house would help get it in order and make it more homely. Her sister Judy would also often come by to visit her. During her visits, the sisters would spend their time together over a hot cup of coffee. However, on the 4th of September 1981, around 8.30 a.m., Judy arrived at Linda's apartment to find something she never expected to see. On the 3rd of September 1981, the night before the murder, Jeff Sladen came home from football practice. But when he found nothing to eat at home, he headed over to his grandparents' place. Later, at about 9.30 p.m., Jeff reached back home only to find the house empty. Around 11.30 p.m., Linda and Tim, her younger son, came home. She mentioned going to a neighbor's place to play a game of cards. But before that, she settled in to complete her chores, and Jeff saw his mom doing the dishes. Tim, on the other hand, went to sleep. Around this time, her son, Jeff, came up to her and apologized since the two had fought earlier that day. As they made up, Linda said goodnight to her boys. Jeff remembers saying these words, I love you, mom. I'll see you tomorrow. Little did he know those would be the last words he would say to her. September 4th, 1981. Around 8.30 a.m., Judy arrived at Linda's apartment. She went up to Linda's room and knocked on the door twice. There was no answer. She thought Linda might still be in bed, but it was unusual as Linda usually woke up before the boys left for school. As she made her way out of the house, she noticed something strange. The window in Linda's room had a missing sheet, and on top of that, the window was wide open. 
Judy returned to Linda's room, knocked again, and this time, opened the door to find Linda Slayton's lifeless body. She screamed. This caught the attention of a caretaker near the house, and he immediately called 911. Linda was found dead with a wire clothes hanger around her neck. Her body was partially naked, and she lay right across the bed with her head down on the floor. There were no signs of struggle. Her cupboard was wide open. Apart from that, all the other things in her room were in their usual places. Within a matter of minutes, the Lakeland police, news reporters, and medical services all arrived. The yellow sign reading, Crime Scene Do Not Enter, was plastered all over Linda's home. Tim and Jeff were both awakened by police officers and were asked to leave their home, which was now a crime scene. While Jeff was able to get past his mother's room without seeing her lifeless body, Tim saw his mother one last time. But this time, she wasn't alive. The two were then sent to live with their grandparents pending further investigation. Linda was 31 years old when she was murdered. As soon as her sons, Tim and Jeff, were sent away to their grandparents, Sergeant Edgar Pickett from the Lakeland Police Department arrived at the crime scene. He was the one who not only led the case but also found crucial evidence at the crime scene. At the beginning of the investigation, Sergeant Edgar found a few prints in Linda's bedroom. Most of the prints belonged to the deceased Linda Slayton. However, there was one print that didn't belong to her. It was a palm print found on Linda's bedroom windowsill, the same windowsill that had a missing window sheet. To find out what really happened to Linda Slayton, she was taken for an autopsy. There, they found several marks and bruises around her arms, shoulders, and neck. Also, when her body was found, she was partially naked, which may have been evidence of sexual assault. After running the autopsy, it was determined that she had been brutally beaten at first, then sexually assaulted, and finally strangled to death with a metal clothes hanger from her own cupboard. Of the evidence found, the palm print was the most crucial, as it could identify the culprit on the spot with a match. However, forensic DNA analysis didn't exist back then. In order to determine who might have been responsible, the police were forced to overlay her entire family tree. The first suspect was Frank Slayton, Linda's ex-husband. Back in 1975, at the time she divorced Frank, Linda stated that he had an aggressive nature, was abusive, and did not take care of his family. It was no doubt that he would be deemed a person of interest in this case. He was taken in for questioning. However, when the officials looked into his whereabouts the night Linda was killed, they found that he was at home in Alabama. Even then, they remained suspicious of him. The second suspect was Linda's own son, Jeff Slayton. But why did the officials think of him as a suspect? Well, before Linda was killed, Jeff Slayton had a heated argument with his mother. Jeff had a very close yet distant relationship with his mother. He, being the eldest son, felt the pressure of living in a family with an abusive father and later with a single mom. There were certain times when Jeff and his mother would often get on each other's bad side, but he always made sure to make up for it. On the night of the murder, Jeff made up with his mother before going to bed. The police questioned him about the incident. They even told him to take two polygraph tests. When he passed, the police cleared him from the list of suspects. The third suspect was Linda's boyfriend. At the time, Linda, a single mom, had started dating someone. The white male who remains unnamed had a close relationship with her and her kids. However, when police ran a background check and polygraph tests, he was cleared. By this time, they were running out of suspects until by September 2001, they got a tip. Almost a year after Linda was murdered, there was a rumor about a 24-year-old man who committed a similar crime. His name was Jimmy Almer. At the time, he was linked to a crime where he pulled a 10-year-old girl through her bedroom window and nearly killed her. When the police ran a check on him, they found that he was convicted to 80 years of prison time. Also, the fact that his crimes and Linda's case were strikingly similar. To top it off, at the time of the murder, Jimmy was found staying in the same apartment complex as Linda did. The evidence found against him made the police think he was the prime suspect. But there was a downside. Jimmy died while the investigation was going on, so it wasn't possible for a DNA match. That would mean they'd have to dig up his body to perform the test. Luckily, Jimmy's mother allowed a DNA test and got a sample. However, once the results came back, there was no match. If it wasn't for the family or the next-door convict, who could have killed Linda? By this time, the days had turned into weeks and then months. In Lakeland, 
Detectives looked at other people as well, but no one was ever charged. And without any new leads, the case turned cold. The Slayton brothers had to face a new reality in life. Their mother was gone, and they had only their grandparents, Clarence and Margaret Harris. While the investigation was going on, Linda's parents and sons held a funeral for her. And soon after, they started to get back to living their lives and regular routines. The brothers went back to school. As time passed, they started to move on from what happened back at 303 North Brunel Parkway. Tim got back into playing football. He even recalls to this day that his teammates and coach were very supportive. When he didn't have a ride back home to his grandparents, Coach Joe would still take him to and from practice. A month later, Tim hung a photograph of his team on his bedroom wall. To him, that picture gave him the motivation to pull past it all and move forward. In the years that followed, the young brothers who just lost their mother grew into men who cared and loved for their own families. Jeff got married and went on to have two children. Tim also got married and started a family. As time went by, both brothers would frequently check in with the Lakeland investigators to see what kind of progress was being made on their mom's case. Jeff Slayton still recalls the night that Linda was murdered. I didn't hear anything, and it's so hard to live like that. Even Linda's neighbors stated that they didn't hear anything unusual the night she was murdered. Despite the fact that Jeff and Tim had each created successful lives for themselves, they made sure that the case was moving forward. Tim reveals this in an interview saying, No matter how many detectives we had to go through over here, we were going to let them know we're still here, and we want to know who killed our mom. 17 years had passed since Linda's passing. But despite the passage of more than a decade, the police persisted in their investigation. By 1998, Sergeant Edgar Pickett had left his position, and the Slayton case was assigned to the new investigation team. Detective Brad Grace was assigned to this case. While going through the pieces of evidence, he found unidentified DNA from the Slayton case that had been collected back in 1981. He sent this to the state's major crime lab at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, also known as the F.D. Lee. By 1999, the F.D. Lee was able to break down and develop a full DNA profile of Linda Slayton's unknown killer. After receiving the DNA profile, he then ran through the list of suspects once again. This time, he was determined to get DNA samples from each one. The year was 2001, and Detective Grace thought that the DNA profile match would definitely reveal the murderer. He made certain to speak with the Clayton brothers first. Soon, he managed to arrange a meeting with them. When the brothers arrived, Detective Grace collected their DNA samples and sent them for further testing. When the results came back, there was no match. Soon after, Jeff's name was completely cleared from the case. Frank Slayton was the next subject of investigation. At this point, Frank had given up drinking. Over the years after Linda's passing, he appeared to have lost some of his aggressive and abusive tendencies. Tim and Jeff were also able to meet their father during this time and mend some of the wounds from the past. Frank agreed to send his DNA for testing. The DNA, however, did not match the hypothetical unidentified DNA profile that the detective believed would point to the murderer. Detective Gray submitted the unidentified DNA profile from the Slayton case to the FBI's National DNA Database in 2005, where it was continually cross-referenced with newly submitted DNA samples. He eliminated dozens of suspects through the course of his investigation using DNA evidence. However, he retired in 2015 after spending 17 years on the Slayton case. After Detective Christ, the Slayton case was assigned to new detectives, Tommy Hathcock, and Russell Hurley. Detective Tammy learned three years into the investigation that the FD Lee had developed a groundbreaking technology that could help in identifying any unidentifiable DNA. Taking advantage of the chance, the detective sent Cece Moore, a genetic genealogist who worked for the FD Lee, the unidentified DNA from the Slayton case. The public genealogy website, JetMatch, which is run by C.C. Moore, produced a list of people who shared DNA with the unidentified killer after she uploaded the anonymous DNA from the Slayton case there. She then used birth certificates, marriage certificates, obituaries, and social media to create a genetic family tree. As the investigation went deeper, Moore created three family tree branches for the murderer, which helped her identify the one person who was most likely to be responsible for the killing of Linda Slayton. 
The family tree built off the DNA profile showed that he was almost certainly the person who murdered Linda Slayton. It was here that the twist got so bizarre that it even shocked Tim and Jeff Slayton. This was the picture that hung on Tim's bedroom wall. And the person just above his shoulder was Joseph Clinton Mills, often called Coach Show. The family tree built off the DNA profile showed that he was almost certainly the person who murdered Linda Slayton. After learning the killer's name, Detective Tammy and Russell got on with Joseph Mills' back on check. They then uncovered some crimes committed by him. One of them was committing grand theft by forging a will. Even though he was never charged for it, the police did get his palm and fingerprints. And as you may recall, Sergeant Edgar Pickett had discovered a palm print on the windowsill at the crime scene. This meant that the family of the deceased might finally receive closure in the cold case, which had been open for more than 40 years at this time. Investigators compared the palm print taken in 1981 from Linda Slayton's windowsill to Mills's palm print, and they discovered a match. But detectives still needed to compare a recent DNA sample from the suspect to the DNA from the Slayton case despite their conclusions. So they made the decision to obtain his DNA for testing without his knowledge. They did this by taking garbage bags from Joseph Mills's house and searching them at the police station for items that could have his DNA. While sorting out the trash, they found a piece of medical adhesive tape in one of the bags that they sent to the crime lab for testing. The detectives looked into Mills' private life in more detail while they awaited the DNA results. He'd spent the majority of his 58 years in Kathleen, Florida, which was only 30 minutes from the crime scene. He had children and grandchildren and was married as well. The results from the crime lab, which were obtained almost two weeks later, showed that the unknown DNA that was found in Mills' DNA on the medical adhesive tape were an exact match. In December 2019, detectives arrested Mills and brought him in for questioning. Back in 1981, Joseph Mills was just around 20 years old when he committed the crime. Just one day after the murder, police also spoke to him, but it was over the phone. During the brief call, Mills told investigators that he dropped him off after football practice on September 3, 1981, the night before the murder, but police never considered him a suspect. Mills said to the cops during his questioning that Linda Slayton had allegedly invited him over for consensual sex, but the detectives were aware that this was a fabrication. They concluded that he targeted her even before the night of the murder as he was often seen picking up Tim for football practice and dropping him off at home after practice. Also, the fact that he stayed near the Slaytons was a matter of suspicion. So what actually happened on the night of September 3, 1981? According to Mills' statement, Mills had just dropped him off at his house after football practice. Later that evening, when no one was home, he returned and broke in through Linda's bedroom window. He then waited for her to go to bed while hiding in her closet. That's when he beat, sexually assaulted, and finally strangled Linda with a wire hanger from her closet. Joseph Mills pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and sexual battery. At his sentencing, members of Linda Slayton's family confronted him and demanded to know why he killed her. Why? I just want to know why why did you take my mama proof you know how my mama was happy. All Mills told the court was, I am a good person, and they didn't receive a response or an apology from him. Mills was given a life sentence in prison without the chance of parole by the judge. Even though the Slayton brothers take some solace from the knowledge that Mills will never escape from prison alive, they're enraged by the fact that he enjoyed all those years of freedom while they spent the majority of their lives without their mother. For Tim, it was something totally unexpected since Coach Joe was a role model for him back in the day. Tim also stated that Mills would often ask him about the case. He'd ask us how the case was going. He wouldn't ask questions. He just, well, is any new news or any new leads? And I was like, no, nothing, you know? To this day, Tim doesn't act believe that his mother's killer was actually the person he trusted the most. Tim even says, I've been carrying the killer's picture in my house at this table the whole time and never had a clue. Jeff, who was completely bereaved, still thinks about what life might have been if Linda were still alive. Tim and Jeff remain extremely close after this incident. They frequently visit their mother's grave, and Jeff always lights a candle on the anniversary of her passing. Despite all that's happened to them, they've never stopped trying to live life to the fullest for their mother. We sure did not expect the outcome of this cold case. What were your thoughts about this twisted case? Do let us know what you think in the comment section below. November 19th, 
1988, was a beautiful fall morning and the first day of Thanksgiving break. Two best friends were excitedly making their way to a grocery store just two blocks from their homes. It was their first trip without adult supervision, and for the two fourth graders, it was a big step toward independence. Little did either of them know a predator lurked in the shadows who was about to turn their happiest memory into a terrible nightmare. Full of twists and turns, this case remains one of the most intriguing mysteries of our time. Hi, and welcome to M7 Crime Story Time, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing to get the latest crime stories directly to your inbox. Today, we take a deep dive into the mysterious disappearance of Michaela Garrett, known as the Heart of the Bay. Hayward, California is the central point to other cities in the East Bay Area. Its residents are described as having a lot of love and community spirit, and its suburban vibe makes it an ideal place to live for families. With the second most diverse population in California, Hayward is as welcoming as its people. Hayward is home to the beautiful Cal State University. And in 1988, Michaela Garrett and her family called it home. Nine-year-old Michaela Joy Garrett was called a miracle child by her parents, Susan Murch and Rod Garrett. For five years, Susan and Rod turned to doctors and fertility treatments before finally welcoming their beautiful daughter into the world. Michaela was born on January 24, 1979, in Oakland, California. Although it was a struggle to conceive Michaela, her parents called her their blessing. As soon after her birth, they welcomed another daughter, Libby, and a son, Alex. In 1986, they made the move to Hayward where they decided to set down roots and raise their growing family. Michaela was described as a bright and lively child. She was well-behaved and listened to everything her parents told her. Sharon was described as a very caring mother, sometimes considered overprotective. She made sure her children were always kept close to home and under no circumstances wandered far without adult supervision. No one could blame her, though. The 1980s saw an increase in child abductions, particularly in the California area. It was a Saturday morning, November 19, 1988, and Michaela had just finished eating breakfast with her family. When her best friend, nine-year-old Katrina Rodriguez, came over to ask Sharon if she and Michaela could go down to the local grocery store to buy snacks. The response was initially a firm no. Upset but not deterred, Michaela begged and pleaded with her mother, promising they'd be safe and come back quickly. Knowing her little girl was going to grow up sooner or later, Sharon relented and allowed them to go while reminding them to be careful. She gave Michaela $5.00 and the girls excitedly grabbed their scooters. Michaela turned to Sharon and said, I love you, Mom, before they made their way down the block and out of sight as Sharon watched them go. Her husband, Ron, decided to go out and do some work on the car, while Sharon went back in to clear up the breakfast dishes, unaware that in the next few minutes, her life was going to change forever. Michaela and Katrina excitedly rode their scooters toward the Rainbow Market on Mission Boulevard. Parking their scooters just in front of the store, both girls made their way inside to buy some snacks. After buying two Mountain Dew sodas, two sticks of beef jerky, and two pieces of cherry taffy, they walked out of the store, completely forgetting about their scooters as they chatted about plans for the holiday. Before they could leave the parking lot, though, both girls realized their scooters were still outside the store. One was missing, and Michaela and Katrina decided to split up to find the other scooter. Michaela spotted it first. It had been moved about three parking spaces away and left next to a car. Without thinking, Michaela ran over to the scooter and bent down to grab hold of the handlebars. In a split second, a man had jumped out of the car and grabbed Michaela around the waist before shoving her into the back seat. Like a deer in the headlights, Katrina stood frozen to the spot as she heard her friend's screams and watched her struggle in the abductor's grip. The man peeled out of the parking space before speeding out on Mission Boulevard, heading toward Union City. Katrina immediately ran back into the store and told the cashier, Rona Ronalin, that Michaela had just been kidnapped. Rona called the local police, who arrived in record time at the crime scene. She also contacted Katrina's father and told him what just happened at the store. Back at their home, Sharon was busy washing up the dishes when she heard frantic shouting from the outside. Rod, her husband, burst through the front door, 
telling her Michaela had just been kidnapped outside the Rainbow Market. Along with Katrina's father, they made their way down to the store to find police swarming the area and speaking to customers and staff from the store. Katrina was inconsolable and was allowed to go back home with her father. Rod and Sharon remained behind, hoping to get some answers. But from deep within, a seed of fear took root as Sharon remembered a poem Michaela had written. Sharon remembered an unsettling incident just a week earlier. She had woken up to find Michaela sitting at the breakfast table, writing in the early hours of the morning. When she asked her what she was doing, Michaela told her mother she was writing a poem but was being vague. Sharon kept asking her what the poem was about, and Michaela said she woke up after hearing noises coming from the attic and thought about people who had been kidnapped and locked away in the attic. She then told Sharon that her poem was about people who were kidnapped and being held captive, not people who were kidnapped and killed. Sharon at the time found it rather ominous that a child as cheerful as Michaela would write a poem like this. Looking back now, she believed Michaela may have written a poem as a kind of prophecy or premonition. Rona, the cashier, was fortunately able to remember the man who allegedly took Michaela. She described him to the police as a white male in his 30s with a mustache. She was able to make out the color of the car as being either burgundy or maroon but could not give them details about the make or model. Rona told police that the man had parked his car and got out, but not entered the store. Instead, he looked on the outside and looked through the window, watching the girls and other customers. She also had a feeling he was planning on possibly robbing the store. A sketch artist quickly drew a composite sketch and circulated the picture to all police stations in the area and news outlets. Investigators found the scooter and took it in as evidence. From the scooter handle, they were able to lift a latent handprint. The print was filed away to be used to identify the kidnapper. But beyond that, there were few clues they could follow up on. By the end of the first day after the abduction, the Federal Bureau of Investigation joined the investigation into Michaela's abduction. Given the recent spate of child abductions, the FBI was sure there must have been some link between Michaela's disappearance and that of the other missing children. However, police soon realized that Katrina may be able to give a bit more information on the suspect as she was the key eyewitness to the abduction. Two days after the incident, investigators paid a visit to Katrina's family home, and together with her parents sat down and spoke to her. What she revealed had investigators reeling. The description of the kidnapper was drastically different from the one given by the store cashier. Katrina described the man as being a white male in his early 20s with long, dirty blonde hair. She said he had severe acne that scarred his face and described his eyes as being blue. Katrina remembered his eyes in particular and said to investigators he had fox eyes. He looked right at me, but didn't even see me. She also told investigators that his car had been either beige or tan box-shaped with visible body damage. This new description was concerning as investigators realized the most crucial 48 hours had passed while they were looking for the wrong person. The posters were reprinted with the new suspect's image and redistributed in hopes of garnering new leads. With the new information, though, investigators now began knocking on the doors of all sex offenders in the local area asking questions. Volunteers came out in their numbers, knocking on doors and handing out posters that included a description of Michaela's clothes, a white t-shirt with the word Metro written across it, rolled up blue denim jeans, black Mary Jane shoes, and pearl-colored feather-shaped earrings. When no one reported any signs of Michaela anywhere in the nearby suburbs, police extended the search to include the Garin National Park and Niles Canyon that were just minutes from the Garrett family home. This search began following a tip from three hikers who allegedly saw footprints in the forested area belonging to one adult and one child. After they'd followed the tracks, they found a blanket and empty fast food containers. A psychological profile also pointed out that the kidnapper was likely to take Michaela to an isolated area. Helicopters were fitted with infrared thermal cameras to pick up any signs of a heat signature within the dense wooded areas. Police officers searched on horseback and foot. All these efforts yielded no results. Michaela had vanished along with her kidnapper into thin air. Michaela's disappearance reached the national news. Her story was featured on Unsolved Mysteries and was one of the first child abductions to feature on America's Most Wanted. Her face was printed on milk cartons, and the Missing Children's Program printed over 50 million mailing cards to homes around the country with pictures of Michaela, a description of her clothes, 
and a composite sketch of the kidnapper. San Francisco 49ers quarterback, Joe Montana, came out in support of the Garrett family and made an appeal to the public to come forward with any information. A reward fund of $70,000 was posted during this time for any information regarding Michaela's whereabouts. Within the first year of her disappearance, police had received over 5,000 tips, most of which turned out to be rumors. But no one was ready to give up. Sharon herself followed leads, some stretching as far as Russia, but nothing yielded any results. It would take another four years before investigators received a new tip that they believed could be real. In that time, over 15,000 tips were received, and police were clutching at each one, hoping it could shed light on the missing girl's case. Between 1991 and 1992, an inmate in Indiana came forward with information regarding Michaela's disappearance. Roger Haggard, who was serving an 11-year sentence for a burglary charge, alleged that he helped a friend bury her body in a gladiolus field in Union City. However, investigators were not initially interested, believing it could have been a wild goose chase. When Haggard realized the investigators were not taking his claim seriously, he instead turned to the media. He wrote a letter in 1992 to the San Francisco Chronicles claiming to know who kidnapped Michaela and where she'd been buried. He promised to lead investigators to her body. The media attention and public outcry forced investigators to fly Haggard to California to testify in front of a grand jury. Under oath, Haggard repeated the claims he'd been making to investigators. Haggard promised to lead investigators not only to Michaela's remains but to the home of the alleged killer. The next day, Haggard, along with a team of investigators, searched the field that he claimed Michaela's body had been buried in. In a shocking twist, after eight hours of intense searching, Haggard allegedly told police that he'd made a false claim after all. He told investigators that he allegedly wanted to give the Garrett family a sense of peace after all these years. Haggard was charged with perjury and sentenced to another six years in prison and ordered to pay Michaela's family $6,000 in damages for giving them false hope. Each new lead was about to take investigators down a darker path than they'd imagined. Another person of interest had long been on police radar in 1991. Timothy Binder was a 43-year-old sewage treatment plant worker. He was married with a family, but investigators were tipped off by parents in the East Bay area about Binder's creepy behavior. Parents alleged that he'd been sending young girls gifts and money to get closer to them. Some of the letters were reportedly written backward and could only be read by using a mirror. Investigators looked into Binder's background and discovered that Binder drove a light blue van with a license plate that read, Love You. The inside of his van was allegedly covered with pictures of little children, crayon drawings, and Bible verses. According to reports, he'd been arrested for attempting to lure two young girls into his van, but the charges were dropped. Binder, investigators discovered, had a knack for inserting himself into the cases surrounding missing children. He had made contact with Michaela's mother, Sharon, following her disappearance in November of 1988. Prior to that, he'd also made contact with Kim Schwartz, the mother of seven-year-old Amber Schwartz who'd gone missing in June of the same year. Both mothers reportedly told police they did not have a good feeling about Binder, and he persisted in contacting them regarding the developments in both cases. In an eerie coincidence, Binder had written a letter to the police after Amber had disappeared. In the letter, he claimed that the next child to go missing would be a nine-year-old girl. Weirdly enough, Michaela was the next child reported missing. In early December, Binder also sent a Christmas card to an FBI profiler with a picture of a girl holding up four fingers. On December 27, 1991, Amanda Campbell, who was age four, went missing from her home in Fairfield. Binder was also linked to the disappearance of 13-year-old Aileen Michael Hoff from Dublin in California. In a turn of events, his generally strange behavior and interest in these cases started to garner him media attention. His name had become synonymous with the recent spate of child abductions, and people turned against him. Binder and his family were being harassed by the public who wanted answers for all the kidnappings. He eventually sued the city of Fairfield for defamation and won the case. Investigators eventually eased off on Binder, with many of the opinion that all he wanted to do was play an important role in the investigation. Beneath all the mysteries, the case continued to captivate the public and challenge the investigators. 
Curtis Sean Anderson had also come under scrutiny following his capture and arrest in August of 2000. Following his arrest, Anderson admitted to the abduction and murder of seven-year-old Ziana Fairchild from Vallejo, California, in 1999. In a 2007 interview with the FBI, Anderson claimed to have killed another 13 women and girls. He also alleged to have abducted and murdered seven-year-old Amber Schwartz, who he saw standing on a street corner. Before he could provide investigators with more information, though, he died on December 9, 2007, from kidney and liver failure. Investigators looked into Anderson's background after his confession about killing multiple girls in his past. Records show that Anderson was pulled over in 1989 while driving a brown 1977 Chevy sedan that matched the vehicle description given by Katrina as well. However, his death left investigators unable to probe that line of investigation. Hope wasn't lost, though. The renewed effort of investigators brought Michaela's kidnapping back into the spotlight, and with it, more attention and new leads. Another twist comes in August 2012. Wesley Sherman teen, who was one half of the murderous duo known as the Speed Freaks, contacted the Stockton Record following the suicide of his partner in crime, Loren Herzog, in January of that year. He pointed out that Herzog bore a striking resemblance to the composite of the suspect in Michaela's case. This was strengthened by Katrina's comment that her son had features that looked very much like the man who kidnapped Michaela. At the direction of Sherman Teen, investigators began digging up a well in Linden, California, where the duo allegedly disposed of their victims. Thousands of bone fragments were discovered, some of which were believed to belong to Michaela. While the investigators never left hope of solving the case, the mystery kept baffling them further. Eight more years would pass before investigators could find a promising lead. The events that took place during this crime were truly shocking and lived a lasting impact on the public, but the real shocker was yet to come. On December 21, 2020, the Hayward Police Department and FBI announced that they'd made an arrest in the case of Michaela Garrett. David Misch, who was 61 years old as of 2022, was charged with the kidnapping and murder of Michaela after his fingerprints were linked using new technology to those lifted from the scooter in 1988. We can announce that 59-year-old David Misch has been charged with the murder of Michaela Garrett. He is in custody at Santa Rita Jail here at Alameda County. A look into Misch's background painted a shocking picture of a man who escaped justice for far too long. David Emery Misch was born on February 19, 1961, in Chicago, Illinois. Not much is known about his life growing up, but by the time he was 16, he had already begun his life of crime. In 1977, Misch was convicted of breaking and entering a property and sexually assaulting a maid at Knife Point. He was arrested but was paroled only a year later in 1978. In February 1979, he was arrested on charges of false imprisonment and assault with a deadly weapon. Those charges were later updated to assault with intent to rape. Once again, he would qualify for parole in September 1981. In May 1988, he was arrested for burglary at a San Leandro grocery store and sentenced to one year in prison and one year probation. He was, however, released six months later in November of the same year. Karma finally caught up with him in December 1988. 38-year-old Margaret Ball was a longtime friend of Mish who often helped him out in a tough spot. It's not certain what transpired between the two, but Margaret was discovered by her stepdaughter beaten and stabbed to death in a pool of blood. The beating was so severe that her front tooth was found a few feet away from her body. Police were alerted to Mish as a suspect as they would later find evidence linking him to the crime. He was arrested and convicted of Margaret's murder. He was sentenced to 18 years to life in 2018. While he was still incarcerated for Margaret Ball's murder, DNA evidence linked Mish to another double homicide in Fremont, California, in 1986. 18-year-old Michelle Xavier and her best friend, 20-year-old Jennifer Dewey, went out to celebrate a birthday dinner of a family member on February 2, 1986. After leaving the restaurant, the young women drove to a convenience store before going home. Shortly after midnight, though, a motorcyclist found both women's bodies on the side of the road. They were stripped naked, and they'd been stabbed and shot. Later, an autopsy revealed that they were also sexually assaulted. Michelle's car was found six miles from the crime scene in the parking lot of a grocery store. 
The case was highly publicized and rewards were offered, but over the years, all leads and tips would fizzle out and the case went cold. 32 years later, DNA technology would lead detectives to David Misch. David Misch was charged with another three counts of murder and one for abduction as he serves out his current sentence. Alameda District Attorney Nancy O'Malley said that Mish had been charged with murder and two special circumstances. If found guilty, he could be given a death sentence. Hayward Police Chief Tony Chaplin said the disappearance of Michaela Garrett was a tragic story that gripped the Bay Area for decades. He said they were not going to stop the search for Michaela's body and remains hopeful that they'll find her. Michaela's father, Rob Garrett, drove over a hundred miles to attend the press conference. Ron said he finds some relief knowing Mish has been identified after all these years. I'm kind of relieved that they caught someone over it. So now I don't got a suspect they can grill, and hopefully he'll cough up wherever the body is, he said. Sharon, who'd been diagnosed with metastatic cancer back in 2019, was unable to attend the press conference. Police Chief Tony Chaplin read a statement on her behalf. In the last year, I had to come to a place of acceptance that Michaela was probably no longer alive. But somehow that acceptance was far more wrapped up in the idea of Michaela sitting on a fluffy thin cloud, walking on streets of gold, dancing on grassy hills, soaring among the stars. What I did not envision was my daughter as a dead child. It was only when I heard this news that this vision of reality appeared, and I've honestly not figured out what to do with it. Misha's attorney Ernie Castillo has been outspoken about the case involving his client. He blasted the investigation, calling the methods used to charge Mish as junk science. He said that the sudden match of the handprint after 32 years just seemed ridiculous. Castillo insists that the police are trying to pin all the blame on Mish as an easy way to close the case. Now a middle-aged woman, Katrina Rodriguez, who married and moved away from Hayward to Texas, still harbors guilt over what happened that fateful Saturday morning. In her mind, it was meant to be her because the scooter that was moved belonged to Katrina. This burden of guilt has driven Katrina to forget her childhood. For Sharon, she dedicated her entire life to finding Michaela. First, she waited at the door of the telephone, and as the years passed, she turned to the internet searching. Sharon eventually started a blog called Dear Michaela. Later, she changed it to Seekers Road. Sharon was eventually diagnosed with cancer, and after Mish was charged with Michaela's murder, the fight slowly faded out of her. She knew she would see her daughter soon. Sharon passed away in May 2022. There was one last twist to come in this already puzzling case. As David Mish awaits trial on the charges of kidnapping and murder in the case of Michaela Garrett and the murders of Michelle Xavier and Jennifer Dewey, New Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price created a ripple among those who had been invested in seeing David Mish pay for his crimes. Price has drawn criticism after making the decision to drop all special circumstances in the three killings. If convicted of all three counts of murder, Mish no longer faces life in prison without parole or the death penalty. After waiting three decades to see Mish pay for his crimes, family, friends, and supporters for Michaela might have to face the reality that Mish could get away with his crimes without facing the appropriate justice. Child safety advocate Michael Klass who's the father of Polly Class, who was abducted and killed in 1993, said it was a complete and utter betrayal. Misha's defense attorney Eddie Castillo welcomed the news. Price's decision doesn't surprise me. In fact, it acknowledges the weakness in their case, he said. Retired Fremont Lieutenant Chuck Euler, who worked on the 1986 Michelle Xavier and Jennifer Dewey murders, for which Mish has also been charged, said, I think there's exceptions to every rule. And if anybody ever deserved maximum punishment, it's David Mish. A former prosecutor and KTVU legal analyst called the move reckless and said it was not a good idea to take any kind of punishment off the table from the get-go. As Michaela's body has still not been found, it could be a bargaining chip for later. This is the poster case for putting someone in prison forever to keep him away from society. David Mish awaits trial on three charges of murder and one of kidnapping. The case of Michaela Garrett has been a story filled with twists and turns that began with a case of mistaken identity that cost law enforcement the first crucial 48 hours of the investigation. It kept a family grasping at straws for decades. And now it may give an alleged killer the opportunity to deny any involvement and keep the truth of a little girl's body's whereabouts a mystery. What do you think of the case? 
Do you believe David Mish is responsible for the kidnapping and possible murder of Michaela? Or has he been used as a scapegoat? Did investigators make too many errors along the way? Let us know in the comments below. As always, stay safe until next time. Like this video and subscribe please.